Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Lunch with a Friend series of bi-weekly presentations on issues that affect the Boundary Waters. I'm Chris Knopp, the Executive Director of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Uh, for over 40 years, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness has been a leader in protecting uh, the Boundary Waters. And we've been uh, the leader because of supporters such as yourself. And uh, I must say that I'm uh, overwhelmed uh, that on this uh, beautiful July day that we have literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that are signing into this uh, live video presentation. The work of the Friends today focuses on three areas, wilderness, people, and community. For the wilderness, there are two mines and one threat to the Boundary Waters. Those two mines are Twin Metals and Polymet, and we're determined to stop both those mines. And the topic of today's presentation deals with Twin Metals. So through lawsuits, legislation, and community action, we are winning the battle with <laughs> Twin Metals and Polymet. For people, we believe that there should be no boundaries to the Boundary Waters. And through our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program, we are connecting young people of all backgrounds to the Boundary Waters through classroom education and wilderness canoe trips for which we provide scholarships. And finally, for community, we recognize that the communities that are gateways to the Boundary Waters, Ely, Grand Marais, and the like, have a shared fate with the future of the Boundary Waters. And we uh, support organizations such as Incredible Ely, Ely Community Partners, and other local organizations that make those communities strong and thrive. We have an extraordinary presentation today, Democracy Dying in the Dark, uncovering the secret Twin Metals in Trump administration war on environmental protections. Our presenter today is Louis Galderi, a documentary filmmaker from Brooklyn, New York. And today's story is a story of an ordinary citizen's quest for truth and justice. In the best of times, our government can be opaque and difficult to deal with. Part of that is the natural inclination of individuals to not have people know what they're doing. And part of it is that uh, uh, ordinary, uh, hardworking civil servants are just busy with their day-to-day -day business and don't want to be bothered by uh, intrusions from the public. But we are not in ordinary times here. With the Trump administration, there's a whole new level of blocking, obfuscation, and delaying so that the public does not know what is going on here. And what we are going to see today are breadcrumbs of corrupt system that is determined to ram the Twin Metals project over the will of the people. Without further ado, I'm going to pass the, uh, the baton on to Louis Galderi. Thank you so much, Louis, for today's presentation. Um, thanks, Chris, and thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us. Um, I have a lot of ground to cover, um, so I'm gonna, but I'm going to try to be brief, and I want to leave room for questions and discussion. Um, so let, let's get started. Um, uh, how did I come to all of this? Well, after making a, a documentary film in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, I started to follow what, a new round of copper and nickel mining, sulfide mining, um, across the Upper Peninsula and then around the lake, up through Minnesota, up to Ontario, all around Lake Superior, home to one-tenth of the world's fresh water. So our focus today on, um, on the Antofagasta Twin Metals Project um, is really part of a larger story, but let's stay focused uh, just on this particular story and on what the Freedom of Information Act uh, has revealed about it. Um, so whenever we want to tell a story, you know, journalists will tell you that you have to ask basic questions. It's who, what, when, where, and why. Um, and the New York Times article that you see up in your uh, uh, left part of the screen um, gives a pretty good answer. Mine plan was stalled until Trump stepped in. That is, Antofagasta's mine was not going forward until Trump stepped in. Um, it's, not, it's still not clear why Trump stepped in and why the Trump administration went to such extraordinary lengths um, to revive this project. Um, uh, former Governor Mark Dayton put it this way, um, you know, why are the financial interests of a Chilean conglomerate um, trumping uh, the need to protect this American wilderness. Um, again, it's not clear why. Um, some people point to this fellow over here, 
a Chilean billionaire named Andronico Luchik Craig, um, whose family controls uh, Antofagasta and who is also uh, Jared and Ivanka's Washington DC landlord. Um, these people suggest that there might be some sort of quid pro quo here. I have uncovered no evidence of anything so apparent or so crude as that, uh, a mansion in exchange for a mine. Um, but this is the way Luchik Craig's likes to operate. He was involved in a scandal in Chile after he arranged for a loan for the newly elected, uh, for the daughter-in-law of the newly elected president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, um, through the Bank of Chile, which by the way, he also controls. Um, I don't have anything so sensational to report, um, as all that would suggest. Um, really what the Freedom of Information Act shows us uh, and allows us to see is how things were done. So let's just get our bearings. Um, this is a, one of the maps that, this map was released as part of a response to a Freedom of Information Act request I made. Um, up here, sort of the boundary waters. Um, Ely's over here, here's the road to Ely. Um, here's the Quishui River going down into Birch Lake. And these mineral leases right here, these green leases are really at the center of this story. Those leases were dead at the end of Obama's second term. The Obama administration decided not to renew them. Now, the Trump administration turned them into zombies. They breathed new life into these dead leases. They brought them back from the dead and they did it by taking three steps. First, in, at the end of 2017, they reversed a legal opinion that the Obama administration had issued. Second, in 2018, they reinstated the leases. That, that is to say, they sort of said, these leases are, are valid again and can be reviewed. And then in 2019, they renewed them. Um, all a great effort. And uh, as the many pages of documents I've gotten suggest, required a lot of effort from a lot of people. Um, and we still don't know why. Um, now, let's, little, let's talk a little bit about uh, what we should expect the Freedom of Information Act to do for us in a case like this. Um, really, the Freedom of Information Act is an outgrowth of the Administrative Procedure Act, which was passed in 1946, um, sort of to set rules for all these agencies in this growing post-war administrative state. Uh, and once you had those rules, that meant that decisions were more open to judicial review, right? You could, you could say, well, were the rules followed or were they not? Um, but still, you know, government, as Chris said in his introduction, government likes to operate in secrecy. And uh, it wasn't until this, this handsome fellow here, John E. Moss, who was a congressman from California, uh, worked tirelessly through six sessions of Congress that President Johnson passed, signed the Freedom of Information Act on July 4th, 1966. But he insisted, uh, interestingly enough, that there be no signing ceremony. Um, he was not a fan of what this uh, act might reveal. Um, I, I put up this quote from Justice Douglas because I think it really helps us get at what the Freedom of Information Act is ultimately about. And Justice Douglas says that the, the Founding Fathers thought secrecy in government was one of the instruments of old world tyranny. And a democracy cannot function unless the people are permitted to know what their government is up to. And that is what the Freedom of Information Act does. It models for, it gives us a model of government that is answerable to the people. And it asks us to be responsible citizens who are, who are keeping an eye on government and making it answer to us. Now, of course, government still doesn't like to be too forthcoming. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, 
as, as some of you may know, this is uh, Minnesota Representative Betty McCollum. Um, and what she's holding in her hands there is a copy of a study that the Obama administration commissioned, a two-year scientific study uh, called a mineral withdrawal study that they commissioned at the, at the end of 2016. Uh, and this scientific study was abruptly canceled and Representative McCollum has been working very hard to, to find out why it was canceled and also to find out what the science said after 18 months before being canceled. This is what she got, a copy of the scientific study uh, with every single page blacked out. Um, that's, that's the Trump administ administration keeping science as a secret. Now, <clears throat> I've run into the same problem of kind of overzealous redaction uh, in my own work, and I just want to give you one small example. Um, this is an email from uh, Gary Lukowski, a lawyer at the Department of the Interior, who was asked to draft some talking points uh, when the Twin Metals decision, the reversal, was issued. And he writes, that, um, he, he writes that he thinks that given today's focus on critical minerals, um, he's put together these talking points and the talking points are fully redacted. So we don't know what they say, but clearly they had some focus on critical minerals. Um, I received that document back in about February of 2019. <clears throat> and just last month I received this, which is the same document, but critical minerals has been redacted. Now, that may be uh, just, uh, you know, a different reviewer, and it may indicate some new sensitivity. It's worth noting <clears throat> that Antofagasta, um, only after 2017, when the Department of the Interior issued a new list of critical minerals, Antofagasta began describing its twin metals project as a source of cobalt, which is on the list of critical minerals. So it's interesting that in 2017, uh, both Antofagasta and the Department of the Interior are basically singing from the same uh, sheet. Uh, and it's not the only instance that I found. Okay, so <clears throat> let's, let's talk about um, sort of how I ended up in this situation. <laughs> um, when you go to file, a Freedom of Information Act request, you find a form very much like this. This is from the Interior Department site. Um, and you can fill out um, what you want. You need to make some good guesses about <clears throat> what sort of communications or documents you want to see and who the custodians of those documents are. That is, who would, who would be holding those documents. <clears throat> but it's a relatively easy form to fill out. And uh, <clears throat> anyone can do it, really. Now, <clears throat> once you've done that, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> once you've done that, um, the agency is supposed to answer you promptly according to the Freedom of Information Act. Well, promptly is subject to a lot of interpretation. Um, in response to one uh, request that I made in 2019, one day I found this on my phone. Um, dear Mr. Yaldiri, basically, it has been determined that the estimated date of completion for your request is April 16th, 2022. So that was a prompt uh, uh, date of completion, I suppose, in their minds. Um, this is not my idea of prompt. Um, <clears throat> when I received from the Department of the Interior, a, uh, a, a release of 5,000 pages of documents related to the Twin Metals project. Um, I published them online on Document Cloud. Um, and uh, as soon as I did that, all communication between me and the Department of Interior was abruptly halted. It ceased. So, uh, I couldn't get in touch with them. I called, I emailed, and finally, uh, I had to file a lawsuit uh, to 
make them comply, to compel them to comply with the Freedom of Information Act. <clears throat> um, there were really two parts <clears throat> to my lawsuit. Um, one was that they had not responded promptly, and the other was that they had not conducted an adequate search. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, after I filed the lawsuit, and we went back and forth quite a bit, in December of uh, 2019, they uh, happened to find 25,000 pages that were responsive to my request, um, uh, and they are now issuing those on a monthly basis. Okay, so let's look at some of what I found, some initial findings uh, from uh, these, this pile of documents I've gotten. Um, first, um, restoring uh, Antofagasta's leases near the Boundary Waters was a top priority for the incoming administration. It ranked right up there with the Keystone XL pipeline and other oil leasing matters uh, that are critical to the Trump administration's energy dominance agenda. Second, there was a lobbying blitz. Um, top interior officials worked hand in hand with lobbyists from the Washington DC firm, Wilmer Hale. Um, one analysis shows that Wilmer Hale lobbyists for Twin Metals met more frequently with interior officials than, uh, than, than officials than executives from BP, who have a lot of access at Interior, and just slightly less than uh, representatives from the American Petroleum Institute. So this was really uh, a, 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 a high priority. Um, I discovered multiple previously undisclosed meetings at the Department of the Interior and the White House with executives from Antofagasta and Twin Metals executives flying up from Argentina and flying down from Minnesota. Um, there's a very odd mention of uh, Antofagasta PLC executives uh, having a meeting at the US Embassy in Santiago, Chile. And finally, meetings with environmental groups and conservation groups were perfunctory kind of meet and greet things and environmental concerns were blithely set aside. Now, let's look at some of the documents that led me to these conclusions. Um, this, I just, I, on this document, I simply want you to notice the date. This is a, 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 a memorandum sent out on February 2nd, 2017, uh, listing the priorities. You see Keystone XL on there, Boundary Waters, aka Twin Metals, and other things. Um, February 2nd is not even two weeks after the inauguration. So not even two weeks after the inauguration, these guys were sitting down to get to work on restoring these leases and reversing the Obama administration's protections for the boundary waters. Um, here's an email that shows uh, uh, one of the lobbyists from Wilmer Hale uh, arranging a meeting for executives from Antofagasta, from, our, from Chile, uh, along with lobbyists from Wilmer Hale um, at the Department of the Interior. This is the first, uh, the first notice I had that there were any meetings between the company and the Department of the Interior. Um, but there are, there are many others. They, met, they meet repeatedly. Um, this is an unusual email and it's, uh, and I'm still trying to, uh, I'm still scratching my head over it. Um, this is an April 2017 email um, sending a briefing paper uh, down to the U.S. Embassy in Santiago, Chile uh, for a meeting with the CEO of Antofagasta, Ivan Ariagada, um, and the U.S. Ambassador to Chile. Now, it's unclear uh, why that meeting took place or what was discussed. Uh, however, uh, once the State Department answers me in 2022, I'll be able to tell you. Uh, this is an email to illustrate uh, the way in which um, uh, environmental concerns um, are typically treated 
<clears throat> in these documents. Um, this is an email from Kathleen Benedetto, then at the Bureau of Land Management, to Doug Dominic, who's taking a briefing uh, for the White House. And, uh, and, and Dominic obviously must have asked, are there, uh, are there environmental concerns? Um, because what she wrote, what she wrote in, advance, in, in reply makes it clear that that's what he was asking. Now, what she does here is very interesting. What she does is two things. She politicizes the issue, saying that, you know, it's just people who are opposed to the mine who have environmental concerns. And then second, she minimizes the footprint of this project, um, saying only that, in, uh, that a lake called Nickel Lake is on trend with a defined deposit. Now, <clears throat> Nickel Lake is a relatively small 23-acre uh, lake. Um, there are lots of large water bodies right around there, including a major river and Birch Lake uh, and, a, and the White Iron Chain of Lakes uh, that, that she should have taken into consideration. She also fails to mention the, the deforestation, the destruction of wetlands, the industrial noise, and uh, the, the risk of acid mine drainage uh, that come in the wake of these kind of sulfide mining projects. And what's really odd is that she makes no mention of the fact that there was, at this time, in, in June of 2017, an ongoing scientific study to determine whether it was safe to allow mining anywhere near the boundary waters. Um, next is, uh, uh, this is a document that uh, uh, Chris and I uh, wrote a, a, sh a short piece about in the Min Post this week. Um, this is a very interesting document because what it shows is that Twin Metals, or Antofagasta really, um, is setting the terms, that is the calendar and the scope of environmental review. Um, they, want, they do not want the, the lease renewal, the renewal of their mineral leases, to, to go through an environmental Im impact statement. And what they, what they really want is something called a categorical, exclu categorical exclusion, which will mean no environmental review virtually, but they'll settle, they say, <clears throat> for a limited environmental uh, assessment. And that is exactly what they get. They get a sort of watered down assessment um, and, uh, and it's done on their calendar. So again, they're setting the terms of environmental review. So what is this? Well, <clears throat> this is a textbook example of regulatory capture. This is industry regulating itself behind the facade of government. Um, it's a form of corruption. Uh, economists call it that. Uh, people who study good government call it that. Um, it places the private over the public and it puts basically the fox in charge of the hen house. So now, <clears throat> having gotten some of these documents, um, uh, there have been some outcomes. Um, they've made their way into congressional hearings um, in the House of Representatives. Um, they, they were introduced in a motion uh, in a case, uh, uh, Voyager versus United States, um, but the motion ended up being denied. And so uh, the case proceeded with an incomplete administrative record. It excluded 5,000 pages and now 7,500 pages at this date of documents. Um, they've gotten some attention in the mass media. The time story that I showed you at the beginning was based in part on, on documents I'd gotten and documents that uh, the Sierra Club got uh, through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and there was a story on um, Fox 9 in, in Minnesota and, and other things like that. They've gotten a little play that way. Um, and so there's some public awareness raised and, and I try to do my best to circulate them on social media, uh, put them up on document cloud and, ha and, and really help, try to help people connect with this information because being connected and sharing information in this environment is really vital. Uh, it's what makes us an informed 
public who are able to hold the government to account. So now, it may seem uh, if, if, in fact, industry is regulating itself behind uh, the facade of government, it may seem that the system has failed us. Uh, it may seem that way for a lot of things these days. But what, what I want to suggest is that, in fact, the system is being forced to fail, which is a whole other project. There's a deliberate effort to make government fail, to engineer a government failure, and to dismantle government. You might remember, uh, right after Trump's election, Steve Bannon said this weird thing. He said, deconstruct the administrative state. And that was kind of a weird thing to say, but uh, in fact, he meant it. He meant take apart that whole state that has existed basically since World War II, that whole regulatory apparatus, deliberately dismantle it. And the Trump administration is doing that in two ways. Uh, first, through judges who are hostile to uh, regulations. And uh, White House counsel Don McGahn gave a speech to the Federalist Society in 2018 in which he basically said, we have to appoint judges who will do away with regulations. Uh, and since he gave that speech, Trump has appointed about 200 judges. So, but this, the main way that, that the Trump administration uh, brings up engineers this kind of failure of government is through sabotage, um, through political appointees. You may have noticed that uh, most people who are appointed to head agencies are hostile to the very mission of that agency. And indeed, most of the people who are currently running the Department of the Interior, as well as the EPA, as well as the Department of Energy, come from the oil, gas, and mining sectors, right? They have strong affiliations to those sectors uh, and, and not much faith to the American public. Um, again, what we're seeing are special interests placed over the public interest, extraction over the preservation of public wealth, and providing for a shared future. And when government is captured in this way, and I wanna emphasize that, government is being captured and sabotaged from within. When government is captured in this way, it prevents other possibilities, both economic and political, from emerging because the government is kind of actively working against it, those possibilities. So what can we do about it? Well, to get started, I wanna suggest that we should <clears throat> acquaint ourselves um, with the documents that are in the record. And I put them online for you. Uh, and if this is your issue, I, I really urge you to search around in them, acquaint yourself with them. Um, if, there is a, if there is a matter that you think needs to be brought to uh, the public eye, I would encourage you to file your own FOIA um, I didn't get to spend too much time on it, but I want to really reiterate, it's not hard. You can figure it out yourself. Um, and in fact, I would say it's your responsibility as a citizen to do it. Um, third, I would urge you to contact your local officials, especially now since uh, Representative McCollum, who was holding that blacked out scientific report, Representative McCollum has introduced a bill um, to protect the boundary waters from uh, pollution uh, from sulfide mining and other industrial development. So contact your elected officials and tell them to support uh, Representative McCollum's bill. And above all, connect with other people who share your interest in these matters, um, because the more we connect, uh, the more we form a public, a we, um, a we the people, uh, who can hold our government to account. Uh, and and I know that these are imperfect answers, but they are at least the beginning of an answer. Now, I just want to leave you with uh, something that uh, Representative Alan Lowenthal of California said uh, in, in a congressional hearing where, in fact, some of the documents I obtained were, were discussed. Um, he's not discussing my documents here. These, these are his opening remarks, but I, I want to play them because he really gets at what is at stake here. And it's not just the boundary waters, although that in itself is pretty grand. Um, it's something even much larger. It's our sense of ourselves as a country. So I'll just let 
uh, uh, Congressman Lowenthal take it from here. America is not a company. It may seem like President Trump is trying to treat us like one, like many of his other companies, and having a, and let us run it into the ground. But America is a country, not a company. And America's lands are not excess inventory that need to be disposed of. Our natural resources are not reserves that need to be booked. So our stock prices stay high and our investors stay happy. Our public lands are an investment that we're holding for our grandchildren and their grandchildren and generations beyond. They're an investment that pays off by allowing them to know our grandchildren, Rachel, what vast stretches of untainted wilderness look like. That lets them see with their own eyes polar bears, sage grouse, mule deer, and caribou running wild and free. That lets them learn about ancient native cultures without having to go to a museum and lets some cultures continue to observe and respect the same tra traditions that their ancestors had. These are all priceless. They're irreplaceable. And these are all infinitely more important than whatever extra few dollars can line in all Baron's pocket over the next few years. Okay, so I, I think you get the gist that America is more than a company, more than a set of assets, and really uh, that's what we have to protect is, our, is a country. Uh, and the work that we do now, as uh, Congressman Lowenthal says, is really work that we're doing for the future, um, for our children, our, our, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and so on. And so I, I, I want to urge you to uh, get engaged in this work. And, um, and I, I like to say, uh, remembering how hard uh, Congressman uh, John E. Moss fought for the Freedom of Information Act, I like to urge people to fight like Moss um, to bring about the kind of change we want to see. So, uh, we're going to have, there are some resources. Uh, this, this presentation will be archived and you can always go back and find these links. Um, you know, links to, my, to the documents I've gotten, to my blog, which discusses them, to the Department of Justice Guide to the FOIA, which will help you if you want to do your own FOIA work, and uh, to a really critical article, uh, which is on the Friends site, which is about the polymet and twin metals mines and the threat that they pose. Um, with that, um, I'm going to turn it uh, over to Chris, uh, and I uh, hopefully we'll have some questions. Great, uh, great, Lewis. Thanks so much for that that uh, in depth look at uh, what's uh, what you uh, uncovered part, as part of your uh, Freedom of Information Act request. Okay. Well. Um, I have only filed one uh, legal complaint, uh, mainly because I'm doing it all by myself as a pro se plaintiff. So only in that case am I getting more documents at this point. Uh, I get a monthly release now as part of a, an agreement that we worked out, a court ordered monthly release. Um, and those range from about a thousand pages to the one I just got is like 195 pages. Um, so I should keep getting those until they've gotten through the 25,000 documents that they found. Um, and then I imagine that we will uh, call it a day. Um, and I'm also considering uh, moving forward in some way on that State Department request, which feels like uh, endless stonewalling until 2022. And we've had some questions about the, 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 the process by which you receive documents. So you receive them as an electronic file. Is that, is that correct? Um, not always. Um, the, the first batch batches, actually, and uh, in response to my main request um, and in response to some other ones, came on CDs. 
Um, and I had to find a computer that still took a CD and uh, loaded on there. Now they're sending PDFs. Now the, the trick is um, they don't always make those PDFs searchable. Um, so if you get uh, a 2000 page PDF and it's not searchable, it's not of much use. However, um, I have a friend who is clever with software uh, who helped me uh, convert those unreadable PDFs into readable PDFs. So it can all be done. We have the technology. Good deal. You know, we've re received some questions and comments uh, relating to uh, 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 the, the process involving uh, our, our uh, public officials here. And uh, for everyone uh, 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 viewing this right now, you can, can see in front of you the, uh, the, the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness has an affiliated, affiliated organization called Friends of the Boundary Waters Action Network. And the website is up there, uh, www.bwcapac.org. And uh, the, the uh, Friends of the Boundary Waters uh, Action Network has enhanced advocacy uh, capabilities to make our elected officials accountable to, to all of us whom they represent. And with, with so much happening, uh, relating to the Boundary Waters and the world at large, the, the elections uh, uh, that 2020 will be one of the most critical years in our lifetime and for the future of the Boundary Waters. And, and, and so go to that website to, um, uh, at, at uh, bwcapac.org to look at ways in which uh, you can be in, involved in holding our, our elected officials more accountable. Because I know there's great concern at both the federal and the state level about how our uh, public officials have been responding uh, in, in, um, in light of the threat from, from Twin Metals here. Uh, there are um, some other uh, questions that, that relate to some legal issues. We discussed some of these legal issues in, in, a, in, a, previous, uh, in, a, in a previous present uh, uh, a previous presentation, and uh, and we will have uh, future uh, presentations as as the lawsuits uh, as the lawsuits progress. And so the you can see the battles are are being fought um, in the in the in the courtrooms, the halls of Congress. Uh, the, the halls of the Minnesota legislature. And, and as we're seeing here uh, with, with Lewis behind the closed doors of, of government officials. And uh, that, that, um, that issue of, of, of regulatory capture, it, that, that's, you know, uh, uh, one of, uh, that's a, uh, there's a mouthful in those, in those two words. It's, it's basically democracy dying in the dark when you have, have regulatory capture. It's uh, when the, the Department of Interior begins working uh, at the behest of a, of a Chilean company, uh, uh, Anifagasta, as opposed to uh, the, the citizens of the United States, uh, we've, we've really uh, lost our way as a as a people, as a, as a, as a government here. Um, you know, there are, are some other uh, questions re relating um, uh, relating to uh, the, the the state of the state of Minnesota, yes, uh, the state of Minnesota has a, a critical role uh, in in the in in the the Twin Metals uh, permitting process, and and yes, uh, the the state of Minnesota can stop Twin Metals from going forward, and so uh, it it is very important to recognize that that the battle is at the federal level, but the battle is also at the state level, and. and Chris Yes, I would just add to that 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 as the polymet um, matter illustrates perfectly, the state of Minnesota also has freedom of information, mm -hmm. um, and documents in the polymet case uh, really turn that around. So um, the more this stuff is brought to light, uh, the better usually the public outcome is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the Minnesota has the Data Processes Act that can be used uh, just like the, the, the Federal uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, as a way of obtaining uh, public documents that belong to, to all of us. Uh, there's uh, 
a, a comment here relating to uh, the wonderful work that Betty McCollum has done. And, and yes, Betty McCollum has introduced legislation, uh, HR 5598, that, that would uh, uh, with, withdraw uh, uh, mineral leases from uh, federal land just uh, 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 along the edge of the boundary waters. And the effect of that would be to prevent uh, uh, twin metals from, from going forward. And, uh, and it, is, it is true that we do not have any Senate sponsors of that legislation. So currently, uh, neither Amy Klobuchar nor Tina Smith, uh, the senators from Minnesota, uh, are, are uh, sponsoring companion uh, legislation. And if you uh, uh, believe that, that, that uh, if you're a supporter of Betty McCollum, uh, uh, and, and, and her legislation, uh, please contact Senators uh, Amy Klobuchar and Tina Smith and, and uh, ask them to, to support uh, uh, the work that, that Betty McCollum is doing here. Let's see, there are more questions here. There, there, there was a, a question, was the reissue of the expired permits ever legally challenged? And, and yes, we, uh, along with uh, several partners, were in, in federal court in Washington, D.C., challenging uh, those expired permits. As, as Lewis mentioned, those are our, uh, uh, our zombie permits. They were dead permits. They had, they had expired, and they were brought to life by, uh, by the Trump administration without going through any uh, environmental review process. And they subsequently were renewed going into the future. And so we have two lawsuits in federal court in Washington, D.C. challenging that. And, uh, um, you know, and there's uh, another question related to uh, uh, Polymet and, and uh, the, the, the role of Glencore in the political process. Uh, uh, here and uh, uh, and uh, yes, we are are, are, are looking into uh, uh, the role that 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 Glencore and Polymet have had on the the regulatory process in, involving uh, in, involving the, the the proposed Polymet sulfide mine. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are, there are two mines and one threat to the Boundary Waters. Polymet is the the other mine. Twin Metals is the one we've been discussing today. And we have several lawsuits in state court uh, challenging Polymet. And we've had a, a string of uh, success over the past year in, 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 uh, in court right now. And we will have um, uh, be before the, uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court this fall uh, uh, in the continued challenge to, to, to stop Twin Metals. Um, there are some uh -huh. more uh, questions here. Uh, let's see, I will try to... Uh, Uh, it, good question. There's a uh, uh, a, a, a question that that, uh, that there's a, a voter initiative on the, the 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 table in Switzerland, the home of Glencore, for harsher punishment for companies abroad and doing harm and social and and social harm. So the, the the comment that you're 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 getting at with with this is, you know, we have bad, there are, there are corporations that have, that. Uh, support workers and make our communities stronger and, and healthier. And there are corporations that, that do just the opposite, that, that sort of uh, suck resources and, and ultimately leave communities worse off. And, and Glencore is one of those. And so uh, one way of dealing with, with, with uh, a company like Glencore is to have a bad actor law. Uh, over the last several decades, uh, laws, bad actor laws have been in place that have prevented uh, the mafia from uh, uh, controlling solid waste and, and garbage hauling. And so a similar bad actor law can, can be put in place to keep uh, bad actors like Glencore from, from operating in the state of Minnesota. And that is something that uh, uh, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness is, is, is looking at now. And I'm going to try to get to some more of these uh, questions here. You know, I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of the takeaways from, from this for everyone uh, watching this right now is that ordinary citizens can make a difference. And that's what, what, uh, what Lewis has done. And, and so, Lewis, you had a couple slides up there that showed what the process was was like, and and you know uh, why don't you know why don't you go again and, and tell people uh, you know how how um, how straightforward that was for you and some of the challenges, so so that we can empower people to um, uh, to do this uh, as well. Okay, um, 
Well, uh, I, I had to learn all, most of this from scratch, um, but uh, for the most part, it is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you need to learn basically the structure of an agency, who's making the decisions. Um, <clears throat> then you need to figure out what you want to find. For example, one of the things I wanted to find right away were communications between uh, Secretary Zinke uh, regarding uh, the Boundary Waters, Twin Metals, uh, Antofagasta, and so on. Uh, so I made a request. My first request included, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted anything that the solicitor's office, which issued this legal opinion, anything they'd done on this, uh, all their communications about this topic, and I wanted Secretary Zinke's. So I filled out the form uh, uh, as, as required, uh, submitted it, and uh, a couple of things happened. One is, uh, I got a reply right away saying, um, we're not sure we can do this without charging you. Um, so you have to demonstrate that you have um, a reasonably broad audience. Uh, and since I'd made a, a documentary film and uh, blogged regularly on the subject uh, and had done some public speaking on it, that was enough for them. Um, second is, and you always have to push back. This is another thing I would say, because they're gonna try, to, they're gonna try not to fill these requests because they're overwhelmed by these requests, especially during this administration. So they're gonna try to push back. The second thing I, I was told was, well, we can't give you Zinke because he, we're not custodians of the secretary's records. And this is a whole complicated area of law that, of administrative law that I had to learn about. Um, there is a case uh, uh, that some friendly lawyers pointed me to called Tax Analyst versus Department of Justice, um, which uh, is about who's a custodian and what ca constitutes custody and so on and so forth. But really you have to be smart about who's gonna have what. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm actually running a separate search with the secretary's office asking for those Zinke records. So I wasted two years with a beginner's mistake. Um, it, it's bound to happen. Um, but but I, I do wanna urge you, encourage you, and, and say that this, these forms are relatively straightforward. You can fill them out. You can submit them right online. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of doing. Um, and if, if you can, if you can uh, argue that it's in the public interest, um, you are likely to get uh, uh, your fees waived and, um, and maybe, just maybe, if you press really hard, you'll get some documents. But it takes um, checking in regularly and making friends. I exchange Christmas greetings uh, with the attorneys at the solicitor's office at the Department of the Interior um, just, just to keep in touch and that was uh, before they kind of blew me off. But um, mm -hmm. it, it just takes some diligence. I don't know if that answers the... Great. And uh, if you go back to the last slide, uh, if you would, please. Very last. Oh, <clears throat> Very last. Mm -hmm. There. There. And you know, uh, Lewis, you you got interested in this because you made a a, a documentary film uh, about uh, um, a, about a, a mining a mining uh, exciting mining story up in in, in Michigan. Uh, 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 do you have do you have a plan to do a, a documentary film about about twin metals here? Um, I would love to do that. Uh, when I set out on this project, I thought that what I was doing was starting an investigative documentary film, kind of a frontline style um, documentary. It turned into a paper chase. Um, uh, and now, uh, due to the pandemic, it's a little hard to, for me to get out uh, anywhere near Lake Superior. Um, but uh, yes, I would love to do that. Um, I, I, I would love to do it First, because I think it's an important story. It's an international story. 
uh, that goes from Ely to Antofagasta. Um, and second, um, because to be honest, um, I really like being uh, up around Lake Superior and up around Boundary Waters. And if I could be producing a film up there, I'd be a pretty happy camper, so. Great. Well, uh, Lewis, thank you so much for your for your uh, uh, presentation. I know we have some out outstanding questions. You know, uh, uh, everyone, if you have some more questions, please feel free to uh, to reach us through our, through our, our our website. You may also uh, contact me by phone, and my phone number is six five one nine 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 five six five. Uh, the, the, the power of, of the effort to continue to protect the boundary waters for another, another 40 years is really based on, on people power. And all of you that are watching today are really the foundation of, of, uh, of our future success. Uh, we will have our next webinar in two weeks on, on July 22nd at 12 noon. And that webinar is Climate Change in the Boundary Waters. And uh, Lee Freelich, the director of the Center for Forest Ecology at the University of Minnesota and a, a nationally and internationally known uh, forest expert will give that, that presentation about the uh, existential threat that, that climate change poses to the boundary waters and, and uh, that the threat of, uh, of uh, that the boreal forest that's up there will not be the forest uh, uh, in, in, in 50 years in 2070. So it's a, a very important presentation. Uh, please take uh, take that in on July 22nd. And again, we have an affiliated organization, Friends of the Boundary Waters Action Network, at www.bwcapac.org. Please take a look at that that website uh, as well. It it, it uh, the, the work uh, um, makes our advocacy work all the more all, all the stronger. Uh, we will have uh, uh, this this uh, uh, this presentation uh, recorded and up on our website. Please uh, take a look at that. We'll also send you a link to the, to the uh, uh, Lewis's presentation so that you can forward that uh, on to others. So uh, thank you so much for uh, for being part of this presentation, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye, and thank you again, Lewis, for all you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.